Thank you. I will now call the uh, regular meeting of the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control Board to order. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, we are conducting the monthly board meeting today by video teleconference. First thing on the agenda is the uh, recognition of a quorum. I will conduct a roll call of board members that are present on this teleconference. When I call your name, please say yes. Steve Sullivan. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Colbert. Yes. Thank you. Dr. May. Yes. Thank you. Candace White. Yes. Thank you. And Keith Joy. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Hamilton, do we have any introductions this morning? Yes, Chairman Houghton, I am extraordinarily pleased to inform the board that Ms. Marisa Neal has been appointed as the newest member of the Lowell Metro Air Pollution Control Board. Marisa Midkip Neal is originally from the Sam Sula Spruce Creek area of Volusia County in Central Florida. And for many of you, that may not mean a whole lot, but for me, it means a tremendous amount. It's not often that I get to meet a rival high school member. Uh, Marisa is a Spruce Creek Hawk, and I am a DeLand High School Bulldog. So on that, welcome to the board, Marisa. She's also a graduate of Stetson University, uh, which is also in DeLand, where she earned a BA and an MBA and MPA degrees from the University of Louisville. Since she moved to Louisville in the 1990s, she's been very involved with local, state, and federal government agencies, including positions with the Louisville Development Authority, which is now part of Develop Louisville, GLI, the Kentucky Finance and Administration Cabinet's Office of Policy and Internal Audit, and the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development. While with GLI, uh, Marisa actually served with uh, a former working group of the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control District, and that was the Kentucky Ozone Prevention Coalition. That's now the CARE Network, and that was back when Mark Williams was the director of APCD. In 2012, Marisa launched a government contracting consulting firm that focuses on federal contracts. Her clients include small businesses, corporations with federal small business subcontracting plans, nonprofits that receive federal grant funding, and government entities. In 2020, she was named the Kentucky Advocate of the Year by the Women's Business Enterprise Council, Ohio River Valley, which is a regional partner organization for the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. And locally, she's continued that same level of activity where she served on the board of the Network of Entrepreneurial Women since 2014. And she's a member of Leadership Louisville, the Rotary Club of Louisville, GLI, St. Matthew's Chamber of Commerce, the Louisville Independent Business Alliance, and she's also a former board member and current sustaining member of the Junior League of Louisville. So, Marisa, welcome to the board. Yeah, thank you so much. I know I, I attended a, quite a few board meetings back in the 90s, so I'm very pleased um, to have this opportunity to join you all. Steve. This is Carl Elton, the board chairman. On behalf yes. of the board, we thank you for your willingness uh, to serve, and we look forward to working with you. Yeah, thank you, Carl. I look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Any other uh, uh, introductions, Ms. Hamilton? No, and there are uh, no public recognitions this morning either, sir. Okay. Uh, moving along, uh, we have the uh, approval of the amendments. Uh, the minutes of the uh, regular meeting held on July the 21st, 2021, were distributed electronically for your review. Are there any changes to the minutes by board members, upgrades, or so forth? Not for me. Okay. Hearing none, uh, the minutes stand approved. Thank you very much. Uh, moving uh, along to public comment, Mr. Gray, has anyone registered to make a comment this morning? No, Chairman Helton. Mr. Gray, has anyone provided written comments? No, Chairman Helton. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public 
I wish to make a, a brief comment on this teleconference. Please raise your hand by tele, uh, teleconference and you will be called on. This is a feature you can find on the participant list or by pressing star three if joining by phone and you will be called upon. Mr. Curry, does anyone mind? I do Alex, not. Wish? Sorry, okay. I do not see any raised hands, Chairman Hilton. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? Well, that completes the public comment portion of the meeting. Moving on to unfinished business. There is no unfinished business. New business. There is no new business. Committee reports. No committee met uh, in the last month. Staff report. We're at the uh, director's report. Mrs. Hamilton. Thank you, Chairman Hilton. And I am very sorry that we're not meeting again in person. Uh, certainly, COVID continues to present new challenges to our return to a more normal operation. Although I will say, uh, currently, Carl and our Jefferson County Attorney Stacy Dot are in our conference room A. Byron and I are in separate working uh, conference rooms here in APCD suite, and our staff are joining us here in the suite at their desk. It's 80 degrees in here this morning, so we've had a little bit of a, an AC issue in the Edison Center. It might not have been all that pleasant to meet in person today. So with that, uh, APCD continues its normal return to work plan that we put in place earlier this summer. Staff are teleworking up to two days a week on a rotating schedule that helps us keep the office uh, staffing at a lower level. We are, of course, wearing masks when we're in a meeting with other people or in the office proper. We're also wearing our masks when we're meeting with the public in the field. I really encourage those who have not yet been vaccinated to do so now. You can call Louisville Metro Public Health and Wellness at 502-912-8598 or your health care provider if you have questions about the vaccination or where to receive that vaccination. Are there any questions about APCD's COVID return plans? So we've previously, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. We previously. Actually, um, Rachel, uh -huh. I was just wondering as an organization, whether or not uh, it's been discussed about mandate or not. At this point in time, we are not required to be vaccinated. We are required to report our vaccination status to Louisville Metro government. So that's where Louisville Metro government is at this point. Thank you. All right, moving on. We've talked previously about PFAS and PFOA. These are the per and polyfluoro alkylated substances. As you may remember, there are thousands of these chemicals that have been introduced in commerce since the early 1940s. They're nicknamed the forever chemicals. They don't break down, just stay in the environment. They also stay in our bodies. And despite their decades long use, they're not well studied. And some have been linked to human health problems, including at this point, birth defects and endocrine disruption. I previously reported on steps that EPA is taking to assess and manage this group of substances and their pollution impact to land, water, and air, but there remains work to be done. EPA considers these substances to be what they call an emerging contaminant. It is getting tremendous amount of effort at EPA's level to better understand these chemicals and to develop a management plan. That said, I want to update you on some recent legislation that passed on July 21st in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's focused on these compounds. If approved by the Senate and signed by the President, the legislation would require industry to clean up contaminated sites and restrict future releases of PFAS and PFOA pollution going forward. Chemical manufacturers would also have to sponsor toxicity studies in order to keep the, their substances in the U.S. market. And the bill at present would restrict introducing any new 
uh, PFAS or PFOA compounds into US commerce for five years. There are additional parts of this legislation. It would speed up procedures that EPA would use to regulate pollution or require chemical manufacturers to test their products. It would require that EPA set federal health-based limits for certain PFAS and PFOA compounds in drinking water and offer grants to communities with water supplies impacted by those substances. Additionally, the legislation would designate those compounds as hazardous substances under the Superfund Hazardous Waste Cleanup Law and as hazardous air pollutants under the Clean Air Act. The legislation now heads to the Senate, so I really encourage those of you who are concerned about this issue to contact your U.S. Senator. And we will continue to track the legislation and update the board as deliberation on it continues. At our last board meeting, Vice Chair Sullivan asked for an update on the American Recovery Plan Act and its opportunity for funding uh, certain activities by the district. So there are both local efforts with the American Recovery Plan monies and US EPA has also received its own $100 million allocation from those ARP, American Recovery Plan funds. Locally, there are four areas that have been identified as priorities for spending the city's $388 million in ARP funds. Those are homelessness and affordable housing, workforce development and small business support, healthy Louisville, healthy neighborhoods, and this would include improving access to health care and child care, mental health, substance abuse, suicide prevention, and promoting and supporting healthier living environments in communities most critically impacted by COVID. And lastly, public safety. The next step is for the Metro Council to meet, review and approve these priority areas. After that, the mayor's office and council budget leaders will work with community partners on the various proposals through an open public request for proposals process. And this will result in development of specific funding uh, within each of those four focus areas. Those projects will be submitted to the full council for approval. So that work is rapidly taking place. I expect by next month's board meeting, we'll be able to provide further update and some clarity on how those funds will ultimately be distributed here in the community. As part of US EPA's $100 million allocation, they've identified $20 million of that funding for competitive grants, and separately, $22.5 million for direct awards to state, local, and tribal air agencies for continuous particulate matter 2.5, PM 2.5, monitored. And that's at the national level. At a more local level, they're also looking at other criteria pollutants in local areas with environmental justice concerns. Here are some of the initial details for each of those funding opportunities. The competitive grants will be open to community groups, state, local, and tribal partners, that includes APCB, individually or in partnership to conduct monitoring pollutants of greatest concerns in communities with health outcome disparities. EPA's primary objective with this grant is to enable communities to monitor their own air quality and to promote monitoring partnerships between communities and state, local, and tribal governments that leverage existing air quality monitoring expertise, expand the use of community monitoring advisory groups and other approaches that give the community a voice in the monitoring of their air quality, and build a foundation of trusting relationships and enhanced understanding from which sustainable solutions to community, community pollution problems can be found. EPA at this point anticipates that that grant proposal will be open for applications in October. It'll close sometime in December, and they will begin to make awards under that competitive grant opportunity in the summer of 2022. I know that sounds like a long time away, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be here faster than I can conceive of it. Similarly, with the direct awards, EPA plans to upgrade state, local, and tribal uh, government gravimetric filter-based PM 2.5 federal reference method, FRM equipment, 
to continuous federal equivalent method, FEM, equipment that uses scattered light spectroscopy. Remaining funds will be used to prioritize investments for monitoring other criteria pollutants in communities with DJ concerns, including upgrading the national ambient air quality standard air monitoring sites in those areas, upgrading certain national ambient air national ambient air quality standard gas monitors or equipment that doesn't meet performance or completeness goals. So that's what EPA is going to plan on using that $22.5 million allocation for. And beginning in uh, this summer, we've already begun our discussions uh, nationally with US EPA. They've opened up listening sessions and they are beginning to talk with EPA regions and state and local tribal partners to assess the needs within that national monitoring community. By fall of 2021, we expect that EPA will begin making direct uh, awards to those uh, air programs in most need. So what does all this mean for APCD? From a competitive grant standpoint, we've identified two projects, the West Louisville Air Toxics Monitoring Project, post-implementation of the Strategic Toxic Air Reduction Program, and an air sensor lending library program that we believe meet the objectives for funding under the ARC Act, either through a competitive grant with US EPA or through Louisville Metro or through you directly through US EPA. Uh, we were recently approached by EPA for some information about these projects directly, and we'll take funding any way we can get it. Uh, whether it comes through the grant or not. But with respect to the first project, the West Louisville Air Toxics Monitoring Program would be a community scale air monitoring project to characterize concentrations of air toxic emissions from point mobile and area sources in Rubbertown and to conduct a health risk assessment to assess the impact of current emissions on surrounding West Louisville residents following the implementation of APCD's Strategic Toxic Air Reduction Program. And those results would be compared to the initial West Louisville Air Toxic Study, which was a risk assessment of air monitoring that was conducted as a community uh, effort with the West Jefferson County Community Task Force, the University of Louisville, APCD, and US EPA. Based on our experience with the West Louisville Air Toxic Study and a review of recent grant awards, we think that this is something that US EPA like the fun. So our second project is a little bit different. We're proposing to develop an air sensor library. These aren't regulatory monitors, but we've all become familiar with purple air monitors. You might see those on the Weather Channel or even some of our own local weather broadcasts may have purple air sensors. Again, not regulatory monitors, but very informative. So our air sensor library will provide sensor technology on loan and air quality expertise from our very fine air monitoring staff and others here at the district to community and school groups seeking to better understand ambient air quality and evaluate neighborhood level impact of localized sources of emissions. This program, once established, will support APCD and community partnerships, educational opportunities for K through 12 classrooms and extracurricular activities and neighborhood level air quality screening efforts through the duration of equipment's useful life. So we believe that that project is something that we hear from the community that would be very accessible and very useful and informative for them. So, as I said, we've asked for funding from local Metro government we will apply for a competitive grant, or we'll see if possible we don't receive funding just directly from US EPA for these projects. And we'll keep the board updated as we go through that process of getting money to take these projects on. With respect to the direct awards, APCD has upgraded all of our air monitoring sites, um, and we operate both the federal reference method, gravimetric PM 2.5 equipment, 
and the federal equivalency method continuous equipment in co-location as we explained at last month's board meeting. So we don't expect to receive much funding from that direct funding opportunity from USEPA. Our other national ambient air quality standard monitoring equipment meets both performance and completeness goals. So we're not expecting any direct funding there either. We have asked for some funding uh, for equipment to measure carbon and PM fines, neither of which is required at this time, and some clarification on the siting criteria uh, to, be under, to be sure that we understand where that equipment can be best located. We want to be sure that it's not limited to our N4 multi pollutant site, which is located at Cannons Lane. But we want to be sure that we can site at another location based on the community and local sources profiles. Are there any questions about the American Recovery Plan? Any questions from board members? Not for me. Thank you very much. So you will note that this month, uh, board materials do not include an air toxics report. Staff have been doing double duty in setting up the photochemical assessment monitoring station at our Cannons Lane Air Force site, which includes a second auto gas chromatograph and maintaining the auto gas chromatograph at our Algonquin Parkway firearms training site, uh, which focuses on air toxics. Both systems have now undergone significant maintenance and troubleshooting and are back in order. That said, we will catch up on the final quality assurance of the data that we provide to the board in subsequent reports. In the meantime, our environmental chemist continues to review the data daily, including conducting an initial quality assurance assessment. And she alerts APCD staff and management if during that initial review, she identifies any outlying data or possible spikes. APCB's permitting and compliance staff investigate and take action if appropriate. And additionally, a cross-functional uh, agency team that includes air monitoring staff and permitting and compliance staff meet monthly to discuss the data. We look at excess emission reports that we've received during that time period, and we evaluate trends and the strategic star, I'm sorry, the strategic toxic air reduction or star program uh, parameters as part of that monthly evaluation. The district uh, has a little bit of background. The star program is at its initial step, a modeling based program. Companies are required to model their emissions, and then the district uses that demonstration of compliance with the environmental acceptability goals established in the program to develop limits, record keeping, reporting, and monitoring requirements that then go into a permit so that the source is able to demonstrate their compliance with those environmental acceptability goals of the program. But the SAR program is a little bit broader than just that. It does include a provision where the district may seek additional reductions based on modeling or monitoring for an individual environmental acceptability goal or cumulative. I know that that's a bit of a wonky subject, but the provision that provides for that uh, additional reduction through either modeling or, or monitoring by the district is found in section six of regulation 521. That's really the, the core of the strategic toxic air reduction program. So if you're not familiar with that provision, I recommend that you uh, go ahead and take a look at that. It is available on the district's website under our regulatory uh, library page. There are two vacancies in our QA section. We are currently hiring for those vacancies. We expect to have folks on shortly. And that will also speed up the time that it takes us to do that final quality assurance review. Are there any questions there? I don't have any, any uh, questions from board members. Thank you. Seeing none. And finally, as you are aware, 
the board entered into an agreed order, order an agreed board order, forgive me, a, it's titled ABO 21-01 with the Metropolitan Sewer District last year to address a spate of odor violations from the summer of 2019. As part of that agreement, MSD has provided an update to the board as required by condition six of the agreed board order. They've also posted that as required on their own website on their odor control page, which you can access at louisvillemsd.org backslash odor. You can also find there additional required reports, including technical memos focusing on addressing odors from the Morris Foreman Water water quality treatment plant, as well as those from the collection system. To date, MSD has satisfied the ongoing obligations of their agreed board order. With respect to the communications plan, MSD has issued a request for proposal for qualified communications agencies, and they've selected Louisville-based advertising and public relations agency, Bandy Carroll Kelly, to assist them with their media relations in satisfying the agreed board order. They anticipate that their communications plan will be a multi-year process, and it's going to include elements including overall com communication strategy and planning. They have decided to brand and develop a logo associated with their odor efforts. Uh, it's going to be named Clarity, C, lowercase l, uppercase a i, i t y. And they will um, go ahead and begin to implement this new branding effort going forward. The odor control page that you may access now will likely be changing in September. They have done additional work to make that more user friendly, and I look forward to seeing their efforts there. They're also working to update their public uh, odor complaint form for submitting odors. They expect that to be live in September of 2021 and to be accessible through their uh, places, their customer service online portal. They're also updating their odor control brochure and flyer. Uh, they will begin to do public service announcements on TV and radio in September, and also some expanded digital advertising uh, beginning in September and running through mid-October. I think this is one of the more important elements, these last two, and that is that they are planning to hold a series of public meetings. I know we continue to hear about odor complaints from MSD and also about how to get in touch with MSD about those odor complaints, but they intend to hold these beginning around in the communities around the Morris Foreman Water Quality Treatment Facility first, and those are expected to begin in late uh, 2021. After they complete these community meter meetings, they will conduct an odor survey, and that will likely take place sometime in early 2022. And so with those elements in mind, you can see how they have identified this to be an ongoing and multi-year process. I am hopeful that the public will let MSD know directly about the odors in and around their homes and that MSD will continue to take efforts to address these odors and to notify the public of issues that may be causing them. So this concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. If there are no questions, uh, Byron Gary will present an ozone national ambient air quality standard update. I just have one quick uh, question, Ms. Hampton, before we go to uh, to the uh, presentation. Um, what is the status? Several months ago, you mentioned that there are several companies and environmental groups uh, filed a federal suit to challenge EPA decision in 2020 to retain the current uh, 70 parts per billion ozone standard. What's the status of that? U.S. EPA has taken on the review of that standard and they're currently conducting that review. Uh, Byron can correct me, I've been on vacation for two weeks, so I'm a little out of touch, but 
My recollection is that they may have a final determination on that. Uh, 2023. Um, I don't know that they have a timeline set yet. Uh, I think they're taking on the PM standard first, the, the uh, fine particulate uh, matter standard or PM 2.5 was finalized before the ozone standard and they also decided to retain that one. Um, so I think they're tackling that one first, which they have said they, they are potentially reconsidering uh, or are reconsidering at this point. Um, they've already um, begun the process of putting together a new policy assessment and re empaneled the fine particulate matter um, uh, um, consulting board for the uh, Clean Air Scientific Advisory Council. Um, so I, I think we'll hear more about ozone later. I think both those suits that were filed are sort of on hold right now because EPA has said they are, are looking at all those decisions again. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, we'll provide you with a more formal update on the ozone standard at next month's board meeting. That'd be great, thank you. So, I think we're ready for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hilton and board members. Um, so everybody here knows me now uh, as our um, secretary treasurer for the board. Uh, my other role for the district, uh, I've been secretary treasurer for um, about six months now, but my other role uh, ongoing has been as regulatory coordinator for the district, uh, going on about five years now in that role. Um, so I'm going to, uh, as part of my role as regulatory coordinator, I handle our, our regulations, of course, but also our state implementation plan, which is how we locally implement uh, the Clean Air Act that has been delegated uh, to us. Um, Ongoing issue right now is, of course, ozone. Um, give you a brief update on the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. Um, of course, we always like to start with uh, at least a brief overview of ozone. Uh, I think everybody has probably seen some version of this slide at some point by now. Uh, but just as a brief reminder, ozone is not directly emitted by any sources. It is um, a, a combination of NOx or nitrogen oxides plus volatile organic compounds, VOCs, reacting in sunlight to form ozone. Uh, so because of that, uh, our ozone season tends to be uh, in the summer. Uh, officially, regulatorily, for monitoring purposes, our ozone season is March through October. But we tend to see the most exceedances in June through August, uh, sometimes going into September. Uh, ozone in the uh, atmosphere has a number of uh, health effects uh, it can cause shortness of breath, it can inflame airways, aggravate lung disease, and increase frequency of asthma attacks. Um, of course, I should also point out this is at the ground level. There is also stratospheric ozone, that ozone layer that we actually try to protect. So we want ozone up high, not down low. Uh, good up high, bad down low. Um, it is not quite as simple as that. Uh, we like to make it as simple as possible to communicate, but I should point out uh, it's not as simple as NOx plus VOCs equals ozone. It's really a series of complicated nonlinear cyclical reactions as shown in that uh, um, formula on the left. Um, it, it goes in cycles. NOx can be both a scavenger and a contributor to the formation of ozone. And of course, it also depends on how much uh, NOx and VOC is in the atmosphere. That ratio between the two uh, determines partially uh, what the most effective way to control ozone is by, uh, you know, bringing down our NOx levels or bringing down our VOC levels. That's sort of what that graph on the right shows. It's not really important that you understand that the details of all that. I'm glad to um, find somebody who knows more about the science to give a more in-depth presentation on that part if you guys are interested. Point is more just this, this is a really complicated pollutant and, and it's been an ongoing struggle for us. Um, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for ozone, of course, has been uh, changed over time. Um, this is a series of images from uh, US EPA showing non-attainment areas for each standard. Uh, in 1997, EPA first adopted the eight-hour standard in the sort of form that we're used to now. And that map on the left shows how many areas were designated non-attainments at some point for that standard. Um, they updated that standard in 2008, lowered it from um, 
from 80 parts per billion to down to uh, 75. And then of course they strengthened it again in 2015 down to 70 parts per billion. Um, the other important thing to point out here, uh, Louisville is in green on the map on the left here. We were designated non-attainment uh, for the 97 standard. We were designated attainment, made that 2008 standard, but then again, marginal non-attainment for the 2015 standard. Um, so what this means is we're still sort of dealing with two separate standards at the same time. Uh, for that 97 standard, we were designated non-attainment in 2004, then redesignated to attainment in 2007. Um, and then in 2015, uh, less than 10 years later, EPA revoked that 1997 standard. Um, this is most important for us as a maintenance area at the time because there are ongoing planning standards under the Clean Air Act, even once you've been redesignated to attainment. Uh, you'll note in 2007, we submitted our first maintenance plan that covered that 10 year planning horizon. We would have been required to submit a second 10 year uh, maintenance plan by 2017, going out to 2027. Um, so even once you're redesignated to attainment, that planning horizon can still cover up to 20 years. When EPA revoked the standard in 2015, they said any area who had already been redesignated to attainment and who was designated as attainment at the time for the 2008 standard didn't have to deal with the 97 standard anymore. They said you, you were good enough then, you made it to the 2008 standard on the initial designations. Um, we're revoking that standard, replacing it with 2008. You don't have to deal with 97 at all anymore. But then a few years later, the uh, circuit court in Washington, D.C. issued a decision uh, commonly called South Coast 2, where they said, EPA, you can't do that. Um, you cannot revoke all of those requirements, particularly for, um, as they labeled us, orphan maintenance areas. Um, so now we are actually behind the ball already. We are supposed to be uh, supposed to have already submitted at the time of the decision a second 10 year maintenance plan. Work on that maintenance plan is ongoing um, and the importance of that will become apparent in just a little bit. Um, parallel to this, sort of a, a parallel timeline, EPA also updated the uh, standard again in 2015. We were designated marginal non attainment in June 2018 with an effective date in August. And after that, uh, it sort of kicked into gear a series of uh, requirements. So basically, a new requirement kicks in every year after that non-attainment designation. The first was that we had to start doing what we call conformity again um, for all of our transportation projects, most specifically, or most um, importantly, we have to show that we are not causing or contributing to a violation of the standard um, when we are required to do conformity. Um, the revocation of the 97 plan sort of threw a wrench in that because at this point we should have already been projecting emissions up to 2027, as I stated, and we would have had a new set of what we call motor vehicle emission budgets to compare against. Um, because that standard was revoked and we're late on submitting that second one, we're still stuck with the original uh, 2007 redesignation and the motor vehicle emission budget set there. So it's kind of important that we update that to make sure that we have a, a standard to compare against. Um, the next requirement was last year, um, the board may uh, recall approving changes to regulation 1.06, our emission statement rule that requires certain sources to report emissions to us annually. Uh, we lowered the threshold. So anybody with uh, greater than 25 tons per year rather than 100, uh, tons per year of NOx or VOCs are now required to report to us annually. Uh, those first reports were due uh, earlier this year. Uh, we also were required to submit an emissions inventory for the complete non-attainment area, which includes not just Jefferson County, but Bullitt and Oldham counties in uh, Kentucky and Floyd and Clark counties over in Indiana. Um, that emissions inventory is past due at this point. Uh, the state has taken on sort of the lead role in that since it covers a broader area and has put out a um, draft of that for public comment right now. Comments are due August 26th, if anybody is interested in commenting on their draft emissions inventory. Uh, the next deadline after that also just passed. Uh, August 3rd of this year was the attainment deadline, as well as the non-attainment new source review SIP uh, deadline. Uh, we did certify that our current non-attainment new source review rule is sufficient. That SIP has been submitted to EPA on time. 
Um, but we are now past our attainment deadline. Um, and under EPA's own rules in the Clean Air Act, they're required to determine whether we made attainment based on the most recent three years of available complete data as of the deadline. So that's a decision that EPA is going to have to make based on 2018 through 2020 uh, monitoring data. Um, you see the note there that anticipated reclassification proposal was originally anticipated around the time of that deadline. Been a little bit delayed, but we still are hearing that it should come in uh, late summer, early fall. So probably sometime in September at this point, it's sounding like. Looking forward on the 2015 standard, um, the deadline for a final action on reclassification of areas that fail to meet that um, deadline is due by third uh, February 3rd, 2022. So by early next year, we anticipate that EPA will be reclassifying us from marginal up to moderate non-attainment because we failed to meet that deadline. This kicks in a whole nother set of requirements for that moderate classification, the first being uh, RAC RACM or reasonably, reasonably available control technology and control measures, uh, reasonable further progress plan, and a 15% plan showing 15% reductions in uh, certain pollutants. Um, by certain deadlines. The, the deadline for moderate non-attainment areas to reach attainment is August 2024. Um, and there are other requirements going forward should we fail to make attainment by any given point, including uh, things like the vehicle inspection and maintenance requirements or the, the VET program potentially having to come back if we fail to make attainment by um, before that requirement becomes due. Um, so where are we? Are, are we making that center? Are we going to make it? And when uh, I, I know everybody is sitting on their edge of their seats waiting to see uh, that monitoring data come in like I am. Um, this graph is another one that probably pretty familiar uh, in some form or another to most everybody. Um, the large colored blocks you can see that standard as it was lowered over the years, the blue being the 97 standard and the orange on the far right being the current 2015 standard. Um, and you can see the trend line of Louisville's monitoring data. Um, each year, DOTS represents a, a three-year average design value because that's how the, the um, attainment or non-attainment is determined. It's based on a three-year average. Um, and currently, our most recent three complete years of data uh, ending in 2020 show us at 0 0.072 parts per million. Um, so we're not quite there yet. Um, this year so far, knock on wood, uh, has been a, a little bit better. Um, Cannons Lane, the uh, third from the left here, um, has only shown one exceedance so far this year, uh, 78 parts per uh, billion in June, um, on June 4th. Um, the Carithers monitor uh, southeast of there has shown three so far, uh, which is the most of any monitor. Um, and just a quick note, um, because we switch units back and forth sometimes here. The official form of the max is in parts per million. So you will see it expressed as 0 0.070 parts per million. Uh, but as a shorthand, we frequently move that decimal place over three places and call it parts per billion instead, because it's a lot easier to say 70 parts per billion than it is 0 0.070 parts per million. Um, and the, the number of exceedance days and exceedances across all our monitors has gone down from year to year. Uh, this chart, as well as the last table, are from our monthly uh, air quality monitoring report distributed to the board and available on our website. Um, so you can see the big jump from year to year, uh, but this year so far has been uh, on par with one of our better years. Um, and this has led to, so far, our preliminary design value in the ozone season isn't done yet, but for the, the most recent uh, data, the three-year average from 2019 to 2021 is 69 parts per billion at our Cannons Lane monitoring site. So, so far, uh, we're making it this year. Um, of course, this doesn't forestall that moderate reclassification since they're required to make that determination based on the, the most complete data at the time of our deadline. Um, but it can help forestall some of those uh, future requirements if we do make it to attainment this year. Um, and uh, just really quickly about the design value, uh, just sort of a wonky bit of math here. It's calculated in a sort of odd way. The standard, as I, I said, is 0.070 parts per million. 
Um, the form of that is the annual fourth highest daily maximum averaged over three years. So for each site, the fourth highest eight hour reading uh, is taken and the, the fourth highest for the most recent three years is average. Um, and each site and each hour are recorded in those parts per million to the third decimal place. And anything after that third decimal isn't rounded, it's actually just cut off, uh, which leads to sort of some confusing calculations, at least to me, it's sort of counterintuitive sometimes. Um, there's sort of a hypothetical there from, from Anna Blaine, or not a hypothetical, but showing 20, 2019 through 2021, I should say, so far, how we got to that 69 parts per billion. Uh, but it leads to counterintuitive uh, hypothetical below. If you were to have three years, one with 70, even 70.9 parts per billion and 71.9 parts per billion and another 71.9 parts per billion, uh, if you truncate each of those third decimal places, add them up and divide by three, you actually get 70 parts per billion. So even if you only have one year actually making the standard, you can sometimes end up in attainments anyway. Um, and, and that's just to explain a little bit about why uh, this next uh, map shows what it does. Um, right now we're at 69 parts per billion uh, for that um, Cannons Lane monitoring site, which is represented in yellow on the map here. Um, but we would need a one year value of 74 to bump us up over. So even though we have 69 right now, it seems like we should be pretty easily bumped up we're right on the edge. It, it would take a few more exceedances actually. So we're, we're doing all right so far. Um, and that Carrither site, which is just southeast of the Cannons Lane site, that Cannons Lane being yellow, um, Carithers has had three exceedances already, but even at that, uh, because of the form of the standard, it would actually um, take a fourth maximum going all the way up to 81 parts per billion in order to uh, bump us up into non-attainment at that monitor. Um, so I just wanted to explain some of the ins and outs and where we are right now. Um, that is all I have as far as the presentation, uh, but I'm glad to take any questions from the board uh, or with um, permission of uh, board, any questions that the public might have. Uh, but I'll turn it back over to, to you, Chairman Hilton. Are there any uh, questions or comments uh, from board members regarding this presentation? This is Steve Sullivan. I, I have a, a question, I guess, is kind of a follow up to the air pollution working group that occurred at the end of 2019 and maybe through early 2020. Yeah. That was going to address um, strategies and uh, programs to reduce ozone. Mm -hmm. Does that have any, is, is that any of that been implemented and you so no, any, any effect related to that? Yeah, uh, you're referring to the multi pollutant stakeholder group. So Correct. the main goal was ozone, of course, but uh, as we address ozone, trying to find strategies that can help us lower other pollutants like PM and air toxics. Um, but a number of those recommendations have actually come into to play. Um, you'll recall a presentation a couple months ago I gave about our air quality action partners plan. Right. That was implementing a number of the recommendations from the point source committee that we, A, um, a that point sources try to find voluntary ways to, to reduce their ozone. Um, B, that we um, encourage point sources to participate in a number of other programs, such as the Kentucky Pollution Prevention Coalition and, and things like this, and see that we give recognition to companies who do uh, take those sort of steps. So we've, we've uh, implemented that one on the point source. Uh, that was the committee that I was uh, sort of um, helping implement. Um, there were a few other ones there that we have begun taking looks at. Um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to any of the other uh, working groups right now, but I know we have definitely been working through a lot of those recommendations Could give you a, a fuller report, perhaps in the future of uh, sort of where we've gone, gone with the MPSG uh, since the time those recommendations were finalized in 2020. Were the voluntary steps from entry, are, are they continue to grow? Because um, I know at first the response was favorable. Yeah, so yeah, we got, um, I think 28 initially, we've only had one additional sign up since uh, that last um, presentation I gave recognizing companies. Um, the sort of deadline for recognition before the board that we set just sort of as an informal uh, timeline was back in April. 
Um, so I think everybody who was going to sign up for this year and had heard about it tried to meet that deadline or work shortly after. I don't anticipate a whole lot more rolling in as this year goes on, but uh, we do intend to continue that program going forward. And we're looking at ways even to potentially expand it beyond those sort of um, large point sources that we permit and trying to partner with uh, other agencies or groups to try and find ways that um, maybe non-point uh, sources or other businesses can help um, contribute to air quality uh, improvements in Louisville. Thank you. Are there, thank you. Are there any other uh, questions from board members? Uh, Mr. Kerr, I have one uh, question. Is it possible that maybe uh, before the end of the year, we could get a presentation on reformulated gas? Because I think we, that is one of the reasons that we are um, attainment in Jefferson County is because of reformulated gas, isn't it? So that's a really tough question, and it goes back to that sort of second slide with all those complicated formulas and graphs. Uh, it's not really possible to say definitively uh, whether any one thing has gotten us to where we are. Uh, and really, the biggest factor year to year tends to be the meteorology. Um, the the long term trend is certainly attributable to a number of different reductions, including reformulated gas, which does have some benefits over. Um, conventional gasoline, um, but um, the the bouncing up and down from year to year that you tend to see is because some summer, right. summers are, are hotter, some are more humid, which is actually a good thing for ozone, some are windier um, and things like that. Uh, but we have given presentations before. I, I think uh, with uh, Director Hamilton's permission, we'd be glad to, to pull one of those up and update it and, and give another presentation on, on the RFG, its benefits and where we stand with it right now. The long and short is, though, until we are in attainment, any reduction would be um, it just as a legal okay. matter, almost impossible to get rid of under the Clean Air Act. So, well, why can't we get rid of reformulated gas? I mean, it's more we're paying more for gas. So, compared to I'll let Rachel step other, in there. Yeah, I'll jump in uh, here quickly. So, like our uh, peers over in Marco Floyd County, here within the Metropolitan Statistical Area. Right. Use of reformulated gas and re vapor pressure gas in Barber Floyd County are part of our control measures that are adopted into our state implementation plan. We've already committed to doing that as part of our ozone management. Okay. Under the Clean Air Act, two conditions. Uh, it's section 110L of the Clean Air Act if you are in attainment, and then it's section 193 of the Clean Air Act if you're in non attainment. Set up very significant bars to removing control measures until an area is able to demonstrate that it either attains the status of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard or that it can maintain that status. So at this point, because we are in non-attainment, it's not possible for us to remove that as a control strategy. Okay, okay. The things that we believe that have also made significant impact and that have helped us meet that downward trend at this point include substantial amount of uh, closing coal-fired electric generating utilities regionally. They produce a tremendous amount, amount of nitrogen oxides or that NOx portion of that NOx plus VOC in the sunlight equation. And as we've explained to the board uh, in our, and with our previous ozone formation study, NOx is the driver for ozone formation here in Louisville. So I think an update later in the fall, Carl, on RFD and yeah. control okay. strategies that we currently use. An assessment of those closing NOx sources around us regionally, and also some additional closures that are going to be taking place in the near future. So you can get a big picture of what's happening regionally. Unfortunately, ozone is challenging, not just from a chemical equation, formation standpoint, but it's a pollutant that doesn't come from a single source and it doesn't abide by any jurisdictional boundary. So we have transported NOx and transported ozone that come into the region that we still have to contend with. So we will go ahead and plan for that. Uh, okay. This possibly well, I just... October. 
any time of year, year, I'm just saying it's a challenge to our pocketbooks because we're paying more for gas in Jefferson County. About that and why that's necessary um, and why it's not possible for us to reduce that control measure at this time. I'm going to point out because it ties back to Mr. Sullivan's question about the MPSG recommendations. Um, one, there was a mobile source recommendation that we do retain RFG at least until we are back in attainment and continue to evaluate it, which we do continue to evaluate. And second, as to Ms. Hamilton's point about uh, power plants, uh, both LG and Mill Creek here in Louisville taking that voluntary ABO as well as regionally, one of the recommendations of the point source committee was that we continue to maintain a sort of um, shared spreadsheet of those closures and how they compare to emissions of various plants. Uh, I have continued to maintain that as I hear about continued closures, particularly upwind of us, uh, and I'd be glad to share that spreadsheet sort of tracking okay. uh, where we are and how that compares to some of the larger power plants upwind of us. Well, and even those Thank smaller you. ones, Carl, as you may remember, directly across the river from us, the Gallagher plant closed in June. Uh, so right. we've had some that are as far away as Paradise and some as nearby as our own backyard. So we will provide you with that update, and I really appreciate Byron having that information at his fingertips. Thank you for Thank that you question. Very much. Uh, are there any other questions from board members? If not, Mr. Gary, thank you for an excellent presentation. Very uh, thank you. Uh, informational uh, regarding ozone. Thank you very much. Uh, moving along, uh, the next thing we have on our agenda is our quarter data. Um, are there any questions regarding the uh, our quarter data uh, information from board members? Um, these reports were uh, distributed uh, electronically. Are there any questions by board members regarding our quality data report? We don't have, we did have the our toxic report for this month. Enforcement status report. Any questions from board members? Okay. Uh, next one, enforcement status report. Any questions? Gordon, the data. And the uh, last one is the uh, complaint investigation status report. Any questions, comments? All the reports uh, look very, uh, uh, very detailed. Uh, staff has done an excellent job of uh, summarizing the, the data for us. Uh, if there is nothing else, uh, uh, I will now adjourn the um, regular meeting of the board and thank you for your participation. The next board meeting is Wednesday, September the 15th at 10 a.m. Thank you again and have a safe day. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Thank you.